edit that bio so it's shorter. Uh, no, thanks for um, the welcome. Thank you for the, the privilege that it is to be here. Uh, I always, I think, I say I have the best job in the world because I get to work with the local church. Uh, I love the local church, whether that's in Swift Current, in North Oakville, where my family attends, in Miske in Bolivia, or in Alahu Village in northern Thailand. Uh, I love the local church, and I believe firmly and strongly that it's through the church that God is at work and uh, changing uh, this world. Uh, this weekend, um, can I have the, the clicker thing? Shoot, I want to introduce to you a little bit about who I am and uh, the organization that I serve with, Canadian Baptist Ministries, and then we'll dig into uh, the topic of, of the, the weekend. So first of all, I'll introduce my family to you. And this is a picture, it's a little bit dated, it's actually not from the Christmas, that, not from last Christmas, it's actually two years ago, but I still use this picture, they still kind of look the same, and the reason I use it is because uh, it's my wife Nicole, my son Eli, my daughter Grace, um, I took this picture, we were living in, in Milton, all of our family is from the East Coast, and that's where home is for me. Um, but we weren't able to be together, and we were trying to take a family selfie to send on, you know, messenger or whatever to say Merry Christmas. And my son, in this picture you can see in the background, was not cooperating. He kept uh, being difficult. So I said to him, fine, Eli, I'm going to use that picture every single time I introduce my family when I'm speaking, and have had chance to do that now for the better part of a year and a half. So soon time to update the picture, but... Uh, I want to be able to, to use this. So I serve with Canadian Baptist Ministries, um, and as, my, as Matt said, my role is helping connect Canadian churches to our partners around the world. And my faith really was shaped and formed significantly when I was in seminary and I studied in Bolivia. I studied with this man, Rene Padilla, uh, a theologian, uh, missiologist, and just a person that loves the church and wants to see communities transformed, a man who lived his life on behalf of the poor. Um, it was in that experience in Bolivia that I had opportunity to visit the Chagas Project, which I know this church is going to be sending a team to uh, next summer. And uh, these pictures are from 2010. It was meeting with this, this woman on the, the right, Salome, and Salome had uh, seven children. She was a widow, and they lived in a small mud home. And uh, all of her children had Chagas disease. But uh, through, through the course of this project, had received testing and treatment, and their home had been renovated. And I remember visiting this home and walking the streets and seeing on the left, you can see home after home after home that had been completed. And it's one of the times in my life that I didn't hear an audible voice from God, but it was very clearly God was speaking to me. Because I had the thought in my head that said, you know, Adrian, what would you do? What length would you go to to help this woman if she was your sister? And just like that, almost immediately, the thought came through my mind very clearly, she is your sister. Um, and since that time, uh, it's been very clear to me that uh, God is calling me to help the church in Canada understand our role to proclaim the gospel in word and to demonstrate that gospel in deed. Uh, just, just as we get started, allow, just let me share a little bit about CBM, Canadian Baptist Ministries. I'm sure some of this is familiar, but we are about 950 churches across Canada that call ourselves Canadian Baptists, this being one. Uh, we work together through four regional bodies, so the Canadian Baptists of Western Canada would be the group that this church would be part of, and cooperating together in one global mission agency, which is CBM, which is where I serve. Everything that we do at CBM is about equipping local churches to live out the gospel in word and deed. Equipping local churches to live out the gospel in word and deed. And we do that in five areas. We do that by building the church. Without the word of God, without evangelism, we have nothing to offer this world. Uh, that's very key to who we are and what we do. Uh, seeking to train leaders to do frontline evangelism. We do that by helping lift people out of poverty. Because if that word's not lived out in action, then it's, 
it's empty. Um, we do that by caring for kids at risk uh, through projects like the Casa de la Amistad in Bolivia, which this, this church will visit. We do that through promoting justice, working for peace building and reconciliation. And then finally, we do that by responding to crisis. So those are the five key areas that we work. All of them are about equipping local churches to live out the gospel in word and deed. I want to switch now to actually the topic that you asked me to come talk about, rather than... And I'm going to actually switch on the slides to, uh, it's a Menti question. It's a website that should be open, I think. Yeah, that one. So what I'm going to get you to do, you probably will have to drag it across, I think. Yeah, perfect. So if you can bring that over, maybe maximize it. Awesome. So what I'm going to get you to do is take out your phones, if you have one. If you don't, you can't participate, but that's okay. Um, I'm going to get you to go to the website, menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. And you're going to put the code in when it asks 332270. And then it's going to give you the opportunity to give three responses. You can give less if you'd like, but you can give up to three. And the question is this, what aspect of faith or Christianity in particular do you think or do you feel is most questioned by society? So we're here, we're going to be talking about, you know, what's our why, the basis of our faith, and presenting an answer for the hope that we have. Uh, But let's start just by getting a feel for the room. Which area of faith, Christianity, do you feel is most questioned by society today? And as your answers come in, they should show up on the screen. And we'll get an idea of what, what you think. Sorry? No, not multiple choice. You, it's, oh, it's actually you have to type it in. M-E-N-T-I dot com 332270. Is the site working for people? Okay, integrity, so it's okay. So the larger the word is, the more people that have given that answer, just... Okay, authority of scripture, scripture, its validity, it's judgmental, morality, integrity is sort of in the middle, so does our, our walk match our talk? Why does evil exist? The trustworthiness of scripture, uh, God in general, like is there a God? Hypocrites, I think that fits with integrity, hypocrisy is there. Truth, free will. So tomorrow afternoon, we're going to focus in on probably what's in the center there, integrity. I think that fits with what we're going to look at tomorrow afternoon. Uh, This morning, or I guess this afternoon now, I want to actually talk about something that I think is at the basis, the foundation of our faith. And I think it's actually questioned quite a bit. I don't see it up here, but that's okay. I want us to, to zero in on the resurrection of Jesus. I guess that fits with all the scripture stuff. So is, is God even real? Is scripture true? Um, the Bible's up there. Yeah, I think, I think it fits there with that. We can switch back to, to the PowerPoint. 
can get rid of this, that would be great. And the theme, the theme verse for this weekend is this, uh, from 1 Peter 3.15, if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it or give an answer. What's the, the reason for the hope that we have? And I would submit and believe that the foundation of our faith, so what's your why, is the resurrection of Jesus. Let's go back to Acts chapter 2. So the portion of Scripture is uh, after Pentecost, after the Holy Spirit comes on the people, Peter stands up and explains what's going on. And it's this sermon that really launched the church, launched the Christian movement. And these are the words that Peter spoke. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. You see, when the church was born... Peter made it very clear that the central truth, the basis of our faith, is the fact that Jesus is alive. Jesus was raised from the dead. See, this is the basis. This is the foundation. This is the truth by which all of the other things either matter or don't. Uh, Peter said this in his other writings, uh, or same 1 Peter 1. He says, Praise be to the God and Father, Lord Jesus Christ. He's given us new birth into a living hope. How? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Paul emphasized this in his letter to the Corinthians. First one, of chapter 15. He says, Brothers and sisters, I remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. For what I received, I passed on to you as first importance. That Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day. The resurrection is that foundation. Paul makes it even clearer later on in this chapter when he says, If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. He says, Our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. So this is the question that I think needs to be answered first and foremost. Is Jesus alive? Because that's really what it boils down to. If we want to talk about giving an answer for our faith, being able to explain the hope that we have, any type of apologetic needs to begin with this. Because if Jesus is alive, then everything else matters. If Jesus was not raised from the dead, then we might as well go home. And this is pointless. So, as we consider this question, as we consider this aspect of Christianity, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, I want us to look at some of the contemporary challenges to this and why I think and why I believe that the simplest and best explanation is that Jesus is in fact alive, is in fact, was in fact risen, raised from the dead. You see, the validity, the validity of our faith does not rest on whether or not God created the universe in six literal days. The validity of our faith does not rest on our theology of end times. The validity of our faith does not rest on all the other different things that uh, the church likes to disagree on and denominations have been formed. The validity of our faith rests on the fact that Jesus is alive. That's what it boils down to. It's probably no, no surprise then that this is 
something that people question. I mean, obviously, right? Have you ever seen someone raised from the dead? My sister-in-law passed away last month, and I believe that she's alive today, but not in bodily resurrection at this time. It's questioned. It's questioned through all kinds of contemporary writings, and uh, people have come up with all kinds of theories about uh, what actually happened. And in the world today, I believe that people do not want to be constrained by the teachings of Jesus, and the way that th- one of the ways that they discredit the teachings of Jesus is by saying the resurrection is myth and legend. We get claims like Jesus died, but his bloodline lives on because he and Mary Magdalene were lovers and they had children. You hear things like the disciples stole Jesus' body and tucked it away and tricked people. Jesus faked his death. That was, that's actually in um, uh, Tabor. James Tabor talks about uh, how the, Jesus actually faked his death in uh, conspired with Pilate. I've actually, in one of these books, it talks about Simon of Cyrene was the one that they crucified. They got it mixed up. See, the Romans couldn't, couldn't tell just who it was, so they crucified the wrong person. There's actually, uh, okay, so this is someone that claims to be a descendant of Jesus and Mary Magdalene. She's made many, many dollars selling books to that claim. Uh, this is a more recent one, James Cameron, the producer of Titanic, right? The, made this film called The Lost Tomb of Jesus, and he claims that the East Talpiot tomb in Jerusalem actually contains the bones of Jesus. Uh, it was reported here, I copied this uh, many years ago, actually, 2007, uh, on CBC News. They never actually reported when it was debunked that it was, the guy was charged by the Israeli Antiquities Commission for forging the inscription on the ossuary, which is the box that contained the, contained the bones. But you get all these crazy claims. Jesus died, but he, he had children of Mary Magdalene, disciples stole his body. Maybe they crucified the wrong person. Uh, actually, we found his tomb, he's there. So how do we as the church, how do we as people who say we follow Jesus, how do we respond to things like this? How do we respond to these type of questions? Again, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do so with gentleness and respect. I think that's important. Do so with gentleness and respect. In Mark chapter 12, Jesus told us to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, our soul, and also our mind. So in the next uh, few minutes, I want us to use our minds, and I want us to consider uh, these different claims, but I want us to actually zero in on the resurrection and say, Does it, is it reasonable? Is it reasonable? Does it make sense? Is it something that we can give an answer to, because I submit that the the typical Christian response, or at least the one that would have been true in the church that I grew up in, would have been just to say, it's in the Bible, therefore it's true. Well, yes, I believe that, but my neighbor might not. And I believe that, but I still want it to make sense and show that it's reasonable. And I believe, actually, that it takes more faith to believe that Jesus was not resurrected than it does to believe that he does, that he was. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through five facts. Five facts, we'll look at each one in a little bit of detail, and then at the end of these five facts, I will, again, make the case that it takes more faith to believe that Jesus was not raised from the dead than to believe that he was. So, fact one. Jesus of Nazareth was a historical person, lived in Nazareth, ministered in Galilee, and was crucified by the Romans. James James Dominic Crossan, who is as 
liberal a Christian scholar as there is. He does not believe in the resurrection. He does not believe much of what's in the Gospels. He wrote this, that he was crucified is as sure as anything historical ever can be. Even people, any legitimate scholar, any legitimate historian believes that there was a person named Jesus from Nazareth, ministered in Galilee, was crucified in Jerusalem. That is undisputed by any legitimate scholar. Um, We have the gospel records, which are very reliable historical texts by even secular standards. There's much more uh, credibility to the gospel record from a historical standpoint than much of the texts that we use for ancient history. Um, But yet, because of the faith component, that's what's questioned. Uh, But there was a person, a human being, named Jesus, who was crucified by the Romans. There's text outside of the Gospels, Roman text. The Romans were very good at keeping record. Uh, We have their their record. We have Jewish texts uh, from that time. The scholarly consensus, even amongst those who don't believe in the resurrection, is that there was a person named Jesus. He was killed by the Romans in Jerusalem. And he was crucified. That fact, I think, is the starting point. That's the most the most basis, basic of it, anything. Everyone agrees with that, okay? Fact one, Jesus was killed. Fact two, Jesus' disciples believed, okay? Jesus' Jesus's disciples believed that he was raised from the dead. Whether or not we accept at this point it actually happened, the fact is his disciples believed it had. Again, multiple sources, both in and out of Scripture, we have the First Corinthians chapter 15, that passage that I read, now I received, but I passed up that one. Uh, that's considered to be an early Christian creed. Um, you know, most of the disciples actually suffered and were killed for their faith. If they were making it up, if they did not believe that Jesus actually was raised from the dead, they might have recanted. <laughs> um, there's one theory in some of those books that I showed you. There's one theory that actually was they were hallucinating. Well, exactly, exactly. Um, <coughs> William Lane Craig, a famous Christian apologist, a prolific author, argues, um, if one denies that Jesus bodily rose from the dead, one would have to believe that the appearances were hallucinations. However, the hallucination theory has several flaws. First, the theory cannot account for the physicality of the appearances, right? There was a physical appearance the disciples experienced. Thomas, touch my hands, right? Um, The number and varied circumstances of the appearance suggest the eyewitnesses were not hallucinating, right? He appeared first to the 12, to the women, to the other people. And it also fails to explain the way the empty tomb. Are we to accept that the disciples hallucinated this all together? Some type of mass hallucination? And I come back to the, the fact that liars make poor martyrs. If the disciples were, had made this up, if the disciples had made it up, they probably would not have been willing to die for their faith if it was just something that they had made up. Okay, so fact one, there was a historical person named Jesus who was crucified by the Romans, Fact two, his disciples actually believed that he was raised from the dead. Fact three, let's look at the conversion of Saul. Again, from Scripture, from other historical sources, we know that there was a person named Saul of Tarsus. He was an enemy of the church, committed to persecuting it, and by his own, his own account, he had an encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. Paul had nothing to gain in this world from making that claim, except maybe his own suffering and martyrdom. That was the only thing he had to gain from making this up. He was willing to suffer continuously and even die for his beliefs. Again, I believe the best explanation for this is that he was telling the truth when he said he had met 
the risen Jesus on the road to Damascus. Fact one, there was a person named Jesus. He was killed. Fact two, his disciples believed he'd been raised from the dead. Fact three, there was a guy named Saul who persecuted the church, persecuted Christians, had some type of experience which he believed was an encounter with the risen Lord Jesus and suffered because of that and dedicated his life to that mission. Fact four, the conversion of James. Remember James, the brother of Jesus, his half-brother, I guess I should say? Um, The gospel record reports that his brothers didn't believe in him, right? Not something that would have been invented by the New Testament writers. Probably if they were going to invent something, they would have said that his whole family believed. Uh, But the gospel record's clear that Jesus' brothers did not, uh, they basically said, just wish that guy would be quiet. They didn't believe he was who he said he was. Think about it. When Jesus was killed, when Jesus was executed, who did he entrust the care of his mother to? Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't his brothers, but John. So something happened after Jesus' death. James did not just become a Christian, but he actually became the leader of the Jerusalem church. And we have the book of James in our New Testament, which is written by him. So there was something that took place that led James, the brother of Jesus, who did not believe he was divine, to become the leader of the Jerusalem church and actually write, pen the words of one of the books of our New Testament. He eventually also died as a martyr. And again... I submit that the only thing that could account for this transformation is, in fact, what we find in 1 Corinthians 15. James had an encounter with the risen Lord. One scholar I read said that if we didn't have the account in 1 Corinthians 15, we would have to invent one. So if there was no other record of Jesus' resurrection, we would have to invent one to explain James' conversion. It's so unlikely Okay, one more. Jesus' tomb was empty. The tomb was empty. Okay, Jesus was killed and buried in Jerusalem, right? It's also, Jerusalem is where the church was born in Acts 2, that passage of scripture that I read at the beginning. If the tomb was not empty, (laughs) it would have been pretty easy to debunk this movement, this Christian movement movement, right? You could have just said, hey, actually, he's right there. Excuse me, his body's right here where we left it. We killed him. He was not raised from the dead. That probably would have been the end of things. A few wing nuts saying that the guy was raised from the dead. Uh, Here's his body. That could have ended the whole movement. So the enemies of the church accused the disciples of stealing his body. Right? That's in the gospel record. They would not accuse them of that if Jesus' body was still there. And again, I find it interesting, another important factor is that it was actually the testimony of women becomes very important here. If this whole thing was made up, if we were just making this up, they never would have cast women in that role. Because sadly, at that time, women did not have the same, uh, the, not the same role, the same uh, important role. That their, their testimony would not have been counted as valid. They would have invented, if they were making this up, they would have made it a bunch of men that found him. Okay, so I've gone through a lot of stuff. So yes, there was a guy, his name was Jesus, the Romans killed him. That's indisputable by any legitimate scholar. Um, His followers believed that he was raised from the dead. Right? They were willing, they believed it so much they were willing to die for that fact. Uh, A chief persecutor of the church named Saul had an encounter that he believed to be the risen Lord Jesus and gave his life 
to that mission. Jesus' brother James, um, who thought he was nuts, actually became a leader of the Jerusalem church, was martyred for his faith, and wrote a text of the New Testament. And the tomb was empty. The tomb was empty. I believe that when you look at these five facts, these five considerations, that it makes sense to believe that Jesus was actually raised from the dead. I believe it takes more work and just as much faith to say that Jesus was not resurrected than to accept the simplest and best explanation that Jesus was declared with power to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. And then people responded in the way that you would expect them to if that was true. Think about it. The people who knew one way or the other whether this was true died for that belief, his disciples. That's the one that is, I rest my, that's the one that is the most significant in my own understanding. Right? It's different than people that die for their faith today because they believe it. The disciples would have known one way or the other, right? They would know if they were making it up. And even it's, let's just let's pretend for a minute they did make it up. Say you made it up and you wanted people to think that he was raised from the dead. Well, that's great. But don't you think when it actually came time to die, if they knew for a fact that they had made this up, they would have changed their story? Or maybe because they knew for a fact that Jesus was raised from the dead, that they need not fear death. Which makes more sense? Which makes more sense? Again, I believe the simplest and the best explanation is that Jesus was declared with power to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. And this, this, so when we look at be prepared to give an answer, this is the foundational truth. This is the foundation of our faith. This is the truth that birthed the church. This is the truth that gives us hope today. And this is the truth that demands our response. I took this picture in uh, San Salvador uh, last year. The capital city of El Salvador, it's a city that uh, has been marred with significant conflict, significant violence. El Salvador is the murder capital of the world, or no, sorry, the murder capital of the Western Hemisphere. Um, two rival gangs uh, visited a beautiful Catholic church in downtown San Salvador. And in this church, they had, the whole thing is like an arch, and it's all stained glass, like through concrete. It's a really, really cool church. But one of the things that I really liked is they had this, this artist had commissioned uh, a series of 15 sculptures with the Stations of the Cross. Now, if you're not familiar, in, in the Catholic tradition, there's the Stations of the Cross that you go through, that Jesus, from the time he was arrested, to his burial. Normally, there's 14. Normally, the last station of the cross is Jesus' body being placed in the tomb. But the artist in this church had added the 15th sculpture. They were all done with this rebar. Um, and I don't know if you can kind of see what's happening here, but the title is Jesus Ha... Uh, that's all I got. Jesus is resurrected. Is the, or Jesus has risen is the English translation. They had added this 15th station. Jesus has risen. This is what defines us. This is who we are. We are followers of the risen Lord. And because he lives, we have hope. Because he lives, we have purpose. And Jesus' resurrection demands our response. It demands our response. It's not enough to just believe it. How do we respond to the truth that Jesus is alive? Our Christian experience needs to be more than an academic one. The resurrection demands our response. The disciples, Paul, James, 
the 500 Christ appeared to, the 3,000 who responded to Peter's message in Acts chapter 2, all responded to the resurrection. The resurrection changed things. In the same way, may we be people who respond to the truth that Jesus is alive by being people that live that out, to live out that truth in what we say and how we communicate with others and in how we act and how we live our lives with integrity, the central kind of point of your word map that you did. May we be people whose deeds match our talk. So I hope that, so to give you an idea where I'm going with this, I wanted to just start with that truth, help it to make a little bit of, to show that the resurrection is the foundational truth, and it makes sense. Tomorrow, I'm um, going to look at our call to proclaim that gospel in word, and then also look at how one of the ways that we give an answer for our faith is through our compassion. So let me pray. God, I thank you for Jesus. We thank you that you are alive. Um, Lord, thank you that our faith is reasonable. Thank you that our faith makes sense. Thank you that we do not... Um, yeah, we do not believe in something that's crazy, but we actually believe in something that actually makes, makes good sense. Lord, may we be people who live out the call of the risen Jesus each day. That's in his name we pray. Amen.